Rutkowski. Yeah. He is here, and we're going to begin with our. Uh, you want me here? You want me here? We can do it either place, whichever you prefer. Why not? This is didn't the first Bush talk about that vision thing that was going on that he was working on. Thank you for the update and the uh, you done and Kathleen about the long history that the leak has. Um, once upon a time I was a leader in Greer down in the Tri Cities League. Uh, Alex Starr put me in uh, to, to do some work and monitor the uh, Union Sanitary District's meetings, and it was hilarious. They meet on Monday, and you know, I'm way out by the in Union City by the Bay, and I remember one Monday getting there at 7:05. The meetings start at 7 o'clock, and they were done. <laughs> And then you got the report, right? You got the report back, and you, but it also opens your eyes on how uh, local governments um, uh, work. But congratulations to all of you who gave up a beautiful spring. I guess it's not spring yet, it's just February. Uh, Saturday to come here and talk about regional matters uh, and the importance and how the local community weaves, uh, weaves into it. You know, we learn from some of the mistakes that we made or things. When you look at how locals will push back on things, I was listening to Ethan talking and I realized that, you know, in the Alameda County, we want to put a, a composting facility in Sonol. And, you know, 150 people in Sonol said you can't do this in our area. It's better to take all this composting material and ship it out to Altima or out there, which has a terrible impact on greenhouse gases and, and moving in. And you look back and you say, how come we didn't do that? That would have been a, a normal thing. And I was on the Fremont City Council at a time when we were looking at Highway 84, you know, the right of way that went through to connect to the Niles Canyon and the Dumbarton Bridge. And I was on the wrong side of the 320 where the city decided that we didn't want to connect this Highway 84 because, you know, break it down, Union City would benefit a little bit more than the city of Fremont. And you say, how parochial can you be in those dark days? Honestly, there are plenty of nifty people that were there that said, I bought my house here. I saw this right away, but I'd like a better deal now at the expense of the region and moving people around. So this idea of regionalism, as Egan has showed, has sort of uh, ebbed and flowed throughout the last 50 years, and it's wonderful to know that ABAC you know, was that leader in 1961. And how can we build on that? And what are the, what are the opportunities? You know, we have some progress sometimes, and then stagnation, it doesn't work. So um, the integration of the Metropolitan Transportation Commission and the Association of Area of Governments, I know it's in its infancy right now, but there's uh, an opportunity for this regional thinking uh, to go to go on in a greater effort um, at coordination. But you know, I guess the question I'll ask is why is that? You know, I think it's worn out of necessity. As you look back and even the the state of Bay League, it was a necessity that we had to try to take some some action. The number of people in the Bay Area continues to grow. It's an attractive place. And I live here in the Bay Area. I've lived here my entire life. I was born in St. Mary's in San Francisco, except for the time when I was in Poland, which is a different time. And then I worked for Don Edwards in Washington, D.C. Even though physically I was in D.C., we were dealing with, you know, at that time, building the center in Fremont at the Don Edwards uh, wildlife refuge, right, and working with El Piso on the learning center. So I was working on things uh, in the area. And you, know, you grow up here. You, I, I tell folks in my district, because a lot of folks, I'm south of San Diego, so a lot of you haven't been there. Uh, but it's just south of, it's in the Palomino County, it's not out in those areas. But, you know, my, people don't come to for tourism interest in Hayward. Although I guess probably Billy's one of the first um, brew pubs uh, 
the, but you look at it, you say you're 30 miles from UC Berkeley, you're 30 miles from Livermore Labs, you're 20 miles from, from Stanford, you're in, the, you're in the Bay Area. There's a lot of industrial properties that are underutilized because Grandpa Pop had a machine shop and now he's there with the sun and it's like a hobby and they've got 10,000 square feet that's not being utilized. So the natural environment on top of that is appealing. You know, East Bay uh, Regional District has done a wonderful job with our open space, with our parks, we're in Penn, we're, you can go down to the wildlife refuge, you can, you can enjoy those academic institutions, the, the culture, the music, yada, 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 yada. So, what's the problem, right? Um, well, we have this vibrant cultural activity, uh, activities, rich professional opportunities, um, Millions of people want to come here, want to stay here. The challenges that we have are a result of our, 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 I guess, our successes. We have such a wonderful place to be that you've got growth, you've got housing challenges, you've got uh, transportation uh, challenges. How do you get together 101 cities to um, have the foresight and the planning that can benefit all of us? Um, if somebody doesn't find their community desirable, they move out. Nobody sees, even with the traffic problems, even with the high cost of housing, nobody wants to see to, to move out. I mean, some people move out, but the majority of us continue to be here to call the Bay Area our home. Our home. So, the challenges have become so severe, however, that, and they're threatening future long-term uh, success of the Bay Area, that things need to be done. Whether I'm talking to CEOs for local businesses or their team, or just the general public, it's always housing and it's always traffic. Both of them neg negatively affect what's happening here. Now, housing costs, you know, notwithstanding the 15 bills that we passed last year in the, in the legislat legislature, and that was a good first step, there'll be another group of uh, bills that would hopefully address the affordability um, that we're challenged with. I mean, if you're making a great salary if you're living in San Francisco or, or, or Oakland or even Fremont, that's, that's great. But if you're not making a great salary, it continues to crush some people and puts uh, strains on it, strains on all of us. So the future of Bay Area in the 21st century is going to be determined on how well we accept regionalism and our interconnectedness and uh, choosing to collaborate versus confrontation. Um, the problems are too steep, they're too severe, and they're too expensive for each city to overcome by going it on their own. I know we've heard America first, America alone, but we can't do that here in the Bay Area. We have to have the Bay Area together. So, the answer is regionalism, it's always been regionalism, it's just how do we package it. So you get, we've got a lot of groups, the League, Bay Area, MTC, APAC, ARC, um, SPUR, Green Belt Alliance, a lot of county organizations have taken big strides in um, uh, uh, working collaboratively and trying to come up with ideas that they can work with. One of I gave a great example that should be fresh in everybody's mind is uh, Measure 8A. You know, the nine county, uh, uh, what was it? Nine county $12 parcel tax that would restore wetlands, that create a big pot of uh, money. And you know, I was happy to participate in that and signing the rebuttal for the, uh, the, the uh, no on AA. But we were raising half a million dollars for the whole region, no matter what county that you're in, uh, over the next 20 years to rec re uh, improve the health of the bay and the habitat of the bay. It's an example that we have, we have to build upon that we work together. Um, that concerted effort shows that we can take our own personal desires and put them aside for a second for the better of the region. Now, in the Senate, I'm the chairman of the uh, Environmental Quality Committee, as well as the chairman of the Budget Subcommittee on um, 
resources, energy, transportation, natural, natural resources. So I oversee all the greenhouse gas reduction fund spending as well as the programs to, to how we're going to, what ideas people have. That includes climate uh, mitigation and adaptation. Um, have always been part of my uh, biggest priority. Um, collaboration has come has to come from all levels of government. The federal, such as it is, the state, the counties, and locals. And if we have everybody competing for you know their, their own interests and limited time, limited resources, you know we're not going to win. So. We know with groups like SPUR and you have these priorities that we're trying to work on. It comes down to some of the points, you know, that we know funding, coordinating, access to scientific uh, information, and then setting those priorities. Um, so what does the state do? We now require cities to include climate adaptation and resiliency strategies in their general plan to better protect their communities. Uh, it's just one way to, to, again, tell the cities. I know there's a, probably local electors here. Here's another state mandate to tell people what they're going to do. Isn't it surprising that there are some cities that don't have a climate action uh, plan? So in 2015, whatever that was, three years ago, I authored a bill. This is prior to Paris. Getting ready to go to the Paris Company Line Farms. I offered a bill that maybe some of you folks are familiar with. It's, it established the Integrated Climate Action and Climate Adaptation and Resiliency Programs. Among the other things, it set up a clearinghouse for climate adaptation, information, and advisory, uh, an advisory council, a technical advisory council to, to help us out. The result, we so said we had four hearings. We had one up in Sacramento. Was in, and, four secretaries from different departments that came in. And what we learned from that hearing was that the Brown administration had already set up a climate action team. And they had already been, I guess the, uh, the magical word is embedded, this idea of adaptation and resiliency into the actions that the public human services, agriculture, all these different agencies were happening. They were working together with information across agency. Well, we didn't know about that. I mean, we sort of knew about it in the legislature. The nonprofits were totally caught up there. And the regional, local people were saying, we do. How about, why don't we share this information? Um, so the Technical Advisory Council, you know, they've been meeting for the last year. They got set up in 2016. And they're, they're supposed to provide this conduit of um, uh, engagement and collaboration with the local governments and the regional governments in, the, in an effort to make California's resiliency an impact currently and an impact in the future. Now remember, you know, Frank Halley at the time was on the committee, and 1832, when you read it over again, just addresses the mitigation. It's climate mitigation. We could not spend money on adaptation unless it had the dual benefits of, of uh, uh, reducing greenhouse gases, which just could be used as a general planning document. Now, the extension of uh, um, cap and trade has loosened up to that. I'm afraid that everybody in the Rock will want such a the high school gym is going to be included in cap and trade expenditure plan. Hopefully, that doesn't, that doesn't occur. But we were really, you know, what, when you get granular and you realize that California produces you know, one percent of the world's greenhouse gases. The technology and the, the, the technology that we have that we can export and the planning documents we can have on adaptation may be more valuable than than whatever gizmo we have on our cement plants that has reduced emissions. I mean I'm not saying that the that the mitigation side is not important, but what the world is looking for is how do we how do we plan to how, how do we reach these emission standards or and how this affects the community? In Mon this last year, uh, I was trying to understand, get a good I get a good feeling of what is two degrees centigrade versus one point five degrees centigrade, because our 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 world plan is to hit two 
and let the US fire to 1.5. It's 23 island nations. You know, that was real to me. It's, if we don't hit 1.5, there will be 23 island nations that we know of that will disappear. So the impacts for Bay Area and sea level rising in California and in the Bay Area, you know, I don't know, I don't know if Foster City will disappear, but there will be impacts here locally, and the tools we're trying to develop internationally and, you know, be nice in the playpen and work together um, is there. So the, the way it's structured is the Office of Planning and Research um, is developing uh, uh, Clarence Clearinghouse from the glass. They've got the initial databases in there. They're providing access to relevant uh, uh, and timely resources on climate, climate adaptation and resiliency. Um, the Office of Planning Research is working with the Oceans Protection Council and UC Berkeley to build this back end of a, a database to improve search functions. So you, cities and planners and people like Spur can go in there, and this new clearing house will allow for a story now where you can get antidotes on um, the region of uh, what adaptation efforts are being done. So in the Bay Area, you would know what was going on or in Los Angeles. Information on financing adaptation, big deal. Big deal on how we're going to pay for this. And then comprehensive linkage to local, national, and global tools on adaptation and resiliency. So it's coming along, and I'm glad uh, that some progress is being made. Now, all of these sources um, will become more comprehensive over time to allow agencies to run the various climate scenarios with mapping technologies and the latest information as they put their plans into place. We will have to advocate for funding, uh, not stop on climate adaptation, because um, we're up against every other worthy cause and interest group that's out there. But hopefully, there are more people, as more people grasp the importance of investing in adaptation and resiliency, we'll see more money available. Now, locally, the BCDC, we were able to put a couple million dollars um, into their, their efforts on uh, spreading the good news on their adapting the rising times. And that planning document can be used for fire situations for the vectors. You know, we haven't even seen the attacks of the mosquitoes and, and these uh, invasive species that come into our areas. I mean, I was stunned when we were in a drought and we had all these vector outbreaks. And I'm thinking, yeah, I, I thought that when it rained, you get puddles, and the tires, all the, the mosquitoes would be in there. And there was such little flow in the rivers that the rivers, rather, rather than, or the creeks, rather than that way, just became little pockets where mosquitoes were able to, to um, grow. So when you intuitively you would think that wouldn't be a problem, it becomes a problem in you know, like extreme heat. Now I'm thinking Fresno, Bakersfield, Grandma Ma's out there and she's dying because it's so hot. No, no, no. We were here in Oakland. The problem is in San Francisco. Because they don't have any AC. They're not built for extreme heat. The deaths are going to occur in in San Francisco and Pacifica. There's another cold place. Sorry, Pacifica. I was fishing there when I was a kid. I was never saw the sun. But those are the places that are going to have the, the uh, unexpected deaths because they're, they're not built that way. So, um, in the adaptation, somehow this June we're going to have uh, about 68, 69, I forget the, the number, which is going to, going to approve the state's uh, park and water bond. Included in that is $123 million on climate adaptation. So says the governor in his state of the state that if that passes, the governor wants to have this first tranche of money that goes out is going to include. Uh, climate adaptation. Now, I'd like to see some regular cap and trade money used for climate adaptation and scientific research. We have some money there. Not to get ahead of myself, but on the cap and trade, what I'm thinking about right now is that we have these 25 percent, 25 percent, 20 percent goes to house. You know, you guys like the house and stuff. Uh, the high school girl gets 25 percent. But the challenge with that is that, you know, the history of the cap and trade auctions have been up and down and up and down. Now it appears as though, because we have at least 
a program until 2030 that they're going to be standardized. And what I've been thinking is that what helps out um, housing advocates, let's just pick out 20%, is that you get a fixed amount. So think about if we were able to, and I don't want to promise anything, but let's say we were just able to, instead of saying 20% of housing, we said 600 million. Then all of a sudden, all the do-gooders that do good in the housing arena would have a stream of money that they would be able to count on in order to leverage with the banks, because that's what, you know, I don't know if there's a lot of financial people here with the lead Bay Area, but the finance people speak a different language than the rest of us, and if they know that they have a, 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 a flow of money coming in, then some of our do-gooder partners would be able to commit money that would be coming down to these different projects. Same amount of money, but just different way that we package it. What's coming up? RM3 is another regional measure that uh, going to a ballot near you soon. Um, for all of you in Cocoa County, just a reminder, I know I'm not the, 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 the keynote speaker you would have, but RM2, 60% of the money from RM2 went to the call of Pat so now some of the money is going to be spent in other things. We have to look at what's best for the rest of the region. I know there's a big chunk of money for Bark to San Jose. I mean, the very essence technically is going to be in San Jose at some time this year, but this idea of extending Bark uh, past the very why you need 101 up in Marin, Sonoma County, adding, adding a whole subsidy program to, to ferries. You know, we've got to do something with the ferries. That was at the Golden Gate National Park, uh, Fort Baker now in Carvello Point, and looking at the area, and I did it. Nancy Skinner's brother works there, so we did a little history tour of, you know, how the fort was built, and it's extremely interesting. There's, in R3, there's $50 million for planning and preliminary engineering for the second Trans Bay 2. Down in the South Bay, you know, I, got, I have a Fremont. The H train comes through underneath Bark six, seven, eight times a day. Capital Quarter comes underneath Bark twice a day. The Amtrak comes down from, uh, from Seattle to LA underneath Bark day. At the Shin area, there's money in there, and I am determined to build another art station where we can have people coming from Modesto and Lathrop and all that get off at BART. I know it's only 0.9 miles from Union City and BART doesn't like that, so what? But now the reality is that people are living out there, they come in, they get off of the East train and they jump on BART and they go to Hayward or they go to Mokinas they go down to Tesla, wherever they're working, and then they can carry on to um, San Jose if they want to do that. So there's there's projects that are in there for everybody. Um, obviously there's more projects <laughs> with the money that we have, right? So it's it's, it's an evolving um, uh, challenge that we um, that we're working on. But these big projects they require uh, regional support because they're expensive and they involve different we cross these county uh, lines. But our area has shown, I mean, we're southbound. We're in Alameda County, San Francisco, Santa Clara County have a rich history. Solano County does not have a rich history of supporting southbound. So polling shows that they're probably not going to support RM3, but there's enough. But they didn't support RM2 or RM1, so. <laughs> All of you people in Solano County, I know you want more, but you don't want to pay for more. So, so that will work out, but, but it allows us to, to, do, to do more with the dollars that we have. Um, collectively, we can do larger infrastructure pro projects than we can do with individual cities. By, but we must always be cognizant of the concerns raised by all the different parts of the county. If a section of the county thinks it's getting shortchanged, they could politically bring, uh, bring down a proposal uh, that's big for us in the ballot box. I think there's a bit, as we improve cooperation with forums like this, uh, we'll, and we look at the challenges geographically, whether it's transit, whether it's open space, whether it's pedestrian, bicycling, um, all, we need to make sure that all our interest groups are on board and they, they understand um, 
what's, what's to be gained. Um, whether you're from San Francisco, or the East Bay, the Peninsula, or the South Bay, um, we can uh, accomplish so much more if we keep an open dialogue, listen to the needs of each region, and work cooperatively to address those issues. If we lose the collaborative collaboration, or lose out on collaboration now, with the huge challenges that we face in the future, it will set us back decades uh, of what needs to be done to create, and create tremendous damage to the quality of life that we have in the regional economy. Now, so you know, I think the legislature, this is my eighth year, the Bay Area Caucus, now we just had a retreat, we meet monthly now. That's new. We, your Senate leaders, and we have to listen to the San Francisco crowd tell us it's all about San Francisco, but besides that, we meet regionally. And we listen to Clay and Baker, they're, they're in on the meetings too, with their, with their perspective. But you're seeing more contact and more coordination with the elected leaders up in, in uh, uh, Sacramento. If we grow smartly, uh, if we integrate uh, our adaptation uh, goals into all levels of planning. You know, one of the, when I was talking about that funding thing, one of the, one of the capital trade ideas that I have is to designate the amount for resiliency and adaptation. It can be filtered into a variety of different projects, but the Office of Planning and Research and the Strategic Growth Council will be giving out grants to people, counties, cities, Nonprofits that come up with these clever ideas of how we can we can implement uh, a vision for more uh, resilience in the area. It's fun to talk. With you guys glad that I can be a fill-in for Mark Sane um, and have a wonderful day. So we're going to move on. There's so much here. This is a very, very uh, uh, 